Absolute truth. What does the Bible have to say about absolute truth? What is the, uh, is there absolute truth today, available today? And who are the ones that are supposed to safeguard absolute truth? That's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to start out defining these two terms, absolute and truth. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines absolute as literally in a general sense, free, independent of anything extraneous, hence complete in itself, positive as an absolute declaration, unconditional as an absolute promise, existing independent of any other cause as God is absolute. Okay? So it's basically saying this is the way it is. No questions, no options. Okay? Absolute means a standard. Something that is real and that exists and that cannot be questioned by the sane rational mind anyhow. What about truth? Truth is defined as conformity to fact or reality, exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be. Very interesting there. The truth of history constitutes its whole value. We rely on the truth of the scriptural prophecies. And then he quotes there, My mouth shall speak truth, Proverbs 8, and sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. Uh, that's what's wrong with your modern day dictionary. They take out a lot of these old definitions there in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. But right there you have the true definition for absolute truth. Truth is something that is apparent, that can be showed, that can be proved. Absolute says, this is the way it is. So absolute truth is, unquestionable documented facts. All right, that's what absolute truth is. Now let's talk about the law of first mention in the Bible. Um, we're gonna look at the first time that truth shows up and then the first time that true shows up. I'm gonna show you something interesting here. Genesis chapter 24. Very first book in your Bible, Genesis 24. Verse 27. Genesis 24, verse 27 says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord, med the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Okay. And um, now let's go to the first time that true shows up. Genesis 42, verse 11. Genesis 42 and verse 11. Okay, it says here, We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. Now let me show you something interesting here. Those two verses that we saw, the first time truth shows up the first time true shows up kind of interesting here you can you know the, the bible says about that all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness well what's the instruction in righteousness here well there is truth with being a christian okay if you're a christian you are required to stand for absolute truth and very interestingly these two passages there, the first time the truth shows up, the first time the true shows up, actually there's some things in those verses that refer almost a future prophecy to what a Christian is. Very interesting. Let's take a look at this. Genesis 24 verse 27 says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham. Now what is our relationship as Christians? What is our relationship to Abraham? Turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Galatians 3, chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. Okay, it says here, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That's why you're called a Christian. Verse 29, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Huh. 
So you have the servant of Abraham back there in Genesis chapter 24, and he goes and he talks about, he says there, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham. So, you know, he was kind of born into Abraham's house there as a bond servant, but, you know, he was part of Abraham's house, his household, and in like manner, Christians, um, most of us are Gentiles, and we're born in, and we actually become heirs according to the promise. So, very similar there, what's going on. How about the next part of that, Genesis 24, verse 27? Who hath not left, who hath not left destitute my master? And the question comes up, has God left Abraham's seed destitute? Okay, who, who is Abraham's seed? The Jewish people, the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Has God left the nation of Israel? Flip too far there. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 verses 1 through 4 says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, you see Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. You know, it's, it's very similar to what a lot of modern day present Christians, or at least professing Christians many times, what they say about the nation of Israel. They say, look at these Jews, they're wicked people. These people over there in Israel, they're very wicked, they're, they're evil, they're into the Talmud and, they're, and the Kabbalah and all these other horrible things. You know, look at those wicked people. But verse 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Hmm. And if you heard the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism sermons, you know what that image of Baal is. It's an obelisk. Very interesting. You know, and you have the modern day steeple house called a church building that has the obelisk on the top in the form of the steeple. You know, it's known. I documented that in my other study. But the whole thing is there, you can look at that nation of Israel and you can say, wow, what a wicked nation. But I guarantee you, God has preserved a remnant within that people. Probably some very Orthodox Jews over there that are saying, you know, we're not going to bow down to the you know, Talmud and the Kabbalah and all this other stuff. And we're looking for our Messiah. We're looking, you know, they're confused. They haven't received Jesus yet as their Messiah. But they will when Moses and Elijah come and preach to them. And there's 144,000 that are sealed. Are they alive today? I believe that they are. And God's reserved those. So this whole teaching of that God has left the, the children of Israel destitute, that they're just thrown off, they're cast off people, and now it's the white Americans or the white Europeans or the, the black Africans or something like this that are the Jews, that stuff is satanic nonsense. All right, Don't ever fall for that. Stay away from that Hebrew roots movement. It's very, very wicked. All right. God has not left destitute Abraham. All right. What's the next part of the verse there? Genesis 24, verse 27. A little breezy today here. crawling on my neck too that helps um, it says here of his mercy and his truth I being in the way that's what Abraham's servant said of his mercy and his truth I being in the way so you see their mercy truth and the way hmm John 14 verse 6 turn there in your Bible you ought to know this verse if you follow this ministry for any amount of time you probably know where I'm going with this John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, remember absolute truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you have there the way. He says here in this passage, that servant of Abraham, he says, I being in the way. 
Isn't that interesting? Are you in the way? Jesus said, I am the way. Are you in Jesus Christ as a Christian? Yeah. Yeah, you should be. How about the truth? Well, that passage there, Genesis 24 there, it says, His truth. How about the life? The way, the truth, the life. What's the thing of, of His mercy there? Well, what is God's mercy for us? Eternal life when we deserved eternal damnation in hell. See? Very interesting there. Kind of a, a prophetic reference to what would come in the, the New Testament. With Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, walking around on the earth. The way, the truth, the life. Mercy, truth, the way. There in the Old Testament. Very interesting. And uh, there's a whole other study there. Maybe I'll do this sometime. But this, these things that are being written there with Abraham and you know Isaac and Jacob, those guys were not under the law because the law wasn't given yet. Now the law is written in their heart. I understand that. But they're not under the same situation there as when the children of Israel were given the Ten Commandments. You know, and so there's many things back there before the giving of the law which actually line up with us today as a Christian. That's why the Bible talks a lot about Abraham being justified by faith. Okay, There was a lot more faith back then to what those guys had to do. So you read about that in Romans chapter 4. And what a lot of the false prophets do that, that try to deny dispensational teaching They'll use those passages that talk about Abraham being justified by faith, and they'll say, then, see, that's all the Old Testament saints. Oh, no, 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 no. Abraham was before the law. Moses was the one that brought the law in. Okay? The, the whole Levitical law and everything else came by Moses. All right? So these guys back then were not under the same system. Abraham was not under the same system as Moses. So to use Abraham to say, that everybody's always been justified by faith, that just shows your ignorance of Scripture. All right? Not true. Getting back to Genesis chapter 24 there, verse 27, it says there, The Lord, med, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Hmm. Did Jesus Christ lead you to the house of his master's, or the, the master, you know, God, did he lead you to the brethren there, the house of, of the brethren? Let's look about that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh... Uh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. See? Very interesting there how that lines up again with that verse in Genesis. You know... Uh, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what about the next one there? You have uh, the brothers of Joseph coming to him when he's in Egypt there, and they're trying to convince him that they're not spies, that they're actually, you know, and Joseph is pretending that he doesn't, you know, know who they are, when in reality he does. But they say here, we are all one man's son. I think that's kind of interesting. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. First John 3. Oops. Who is your father right now if you're a saved Christian? Okay, it says here, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So, who is the 
we are all one man's sons. Well, the man there, God the Father, we are all his sons. See, it doesn't say anything in that passage about being sons and daughters. Now, God does you know, talk about that, about, you know, ye shall be unto me sons and daughters. You know, you see that, um, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 talks about that. Um, but the point is there, many times as a Christian, you are just referred to as a son, whether you're male or female. You're just a son, you know, in God's sight. And, you know, there's really no problem with that because, you know, that's the way God's written the thing. So, but you see there again, another tie into that, the first time that the word true appears in the Old Testament. Um, what about we are true men? That thing that shows up there, uh, they say first we are all one man's son, sons, we are true men. Look over at chapter 2 there in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 verse 20. It says here, But we have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you, because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. What room do you have in your life as a Christian for lies? Well, hopefully not too much room for that. I mean, if you know something is a lie, and you're holding on to it, I think the Lord's going to kind of have a controversy with that. I mean, if a child is in the home of a father, and the father says, I don't want you bringing such and such into my home, and the child brings that into the house, do you think the father's not going to have a problem with that? See? As a Christian, you should, you should go through your life and you should find things that are lies or false or, or wrong, and you should get rid of those things. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians hold on to lies, which we'll be talking about as we continue in the study. Galatians chapter 2. Turn next to Galatians chapter 2. What was the last part there of that passage in Genesis? They said there, thy servants are no spies. Okay? Thy servants are no spies. Uh, Galatians 2 verses 3 through 5 says, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You know, and this is what you have with this whole Hebrew roots movement. They come in and they try to get you back under the law. They come in, they try to say you're justified by the law. Okay? Now, there should be works meet for repentance. I understand that. But I never taught and I never teach that it's works excluding faith. Ah, uh, faith and then works meet for repentance. That comes afterward. But when you have somebody that says it's not the faith of Jesus, it's actually works, good works. You clean up your life first and then you're saved. No, that doesn't work. Okay? And what they'll try to say is they'll, they'll look at your liberty and they'll say, you mean to tell me? Let, I, I actually ran into a guy at a gas station one time, a Methodist pastor from down south. He actually said this to me. He said, do you mean to tell me? You believe in eternal security? I said, absolutely. He said, do you mean to tell me that I could go and fornicate with a woman that's not with my wife and get drunk and then kill her and I'd still go to heaven? And I said, absolutely, yeah. You aren't going to lose your salvation because it's God, His gift to you. All right, He purchased you with His blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And he said, that's heresy, that's ridiculous. And I said, okay, then, how are you justified? By the blood or by your works? You see, that's really what's behind this whole no eternal security thing. I mean, hey, if you can lose your salvation, then how do you keep it? See? And you have these false brethren many times that come in to spy out your liberty. They come in and they start to present questions and start to put doubts in your mind. Why? They're trying to bring you into bondage. You, want, you know what one of the worst forms of bondage is in this world? Thinking that you can lose your salvation and trying to have to keep it. You talk about torment. If I thought that I had to try and keep my salvation, I'd be a nervous wreck. Why? 
because I struggle with sin all the time. And there are many times that I'll sin. It's not that I just go around and never try to stop myself from sinning. It's just that my nature is, you know, angled towards sin. And there are many times I'll sin and I just think, oh, that was really stupid. But how would it be if I was always worried about losing my salvation? See, I'd be a nervous wreck, you know, like a lot of people are that don't believe in eternal security, trying to keep themselves saved. You can't keep yourself saved. But you see, what is the thing about there? They say, uh, we are no spies. Thy servants are no spies. Well, a true servant of Jesus Christ is not a spy. In other words, a false prophet, a false brethren, as it says there in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. And by the way, if salvation is only believe and receive, then how can you have false brethren? See, it doesn't work. All right? And you get these people who deny eternal security. I would say most of the time, if they're not confused, I mean, I, I know there are some brethren that get confused on the issue. They're really trying to live righteously, and so they, they don't like the idea of people saying you can sin and still be saved. And the, and the way they fight that is by saying, no, you can lose your salvation. You have to keep yourself safe. I know that there are some brethren that are confused. But somebody who really has this thing worked out and they're really trying to work their way to heaven, they're not saved. Because you have to come, salvation, brethren, is coming to the end of yourself. Where you say, I can't do anything good enough to get into heaven. And I put my faith totally in Jesus Christ. That's repentance at that point in time. When you come to the end of yourself. When you stop thinking that you can work your way into heaven. And then you say, I don't know what all this entails, this salvation thing, but I can't be good enough to get in. I know as a fact I can't get in. So I'm coming to you, God, as, as, as a worthless sinner. I have no self-righteousness anymore. I know I can't save myself. Please save me. Because if you don't, I'm going to go to hell. That's salvation. That is true repentance that leads to salvation. Coming to the end of yourself. But a lot of these people, they try to work their way into heaven. They try to be good enough. They try, to, I'm really trying. I'm, I'm working so hard to get to heaven. Well, you're going to work your way into hell. You know, very sad, very tragic. So very interesting parallels there between those two passages in Genesis and how that they line up with a Christian today. Very, very interesting. Now, since Jesus Christ is truth personified, and he is, he said, I am the truth. All truth is tied to Jesus Christ. Since he is truth personified, who in this world, who are the people that are to be keepers of the truth? You know, you say, uh, maybe the Muslims. <laughs> yeah, right. How about uh, the Buddhists? You know, you Muslims, you got the, the founder of the Islamic cult is a sex pervert. You know, he's not the one that would be the one that would have absolute truth. How about the Buddhists? Well, they deny absolute truth. <laughs> They say, you know, truth is relative and, you know, if you, do, if you kind of, you know, trip out in some kind of meditation thing, then you don't have to accept truth and you can make your own reality and stuff, you know, cuckoo. Um, how about the Catholics? The Catholics don't believe in absolute truth. They believe in truth that's changing. Uh, well, the church has stood, stood for 2,000 years. No, it hasn't. You study the history of Catholicism, they're changing their doctrines all the time. A lot of the things that they call dogma or doctrine, official doctrine today, only date back into the last 100 or 200 years. And nobody before then believed it. You know, check out the uh, um, Assumption of Mary and the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Those are just recent dogmas. So, you know, who are the ones that keep absolute truth? Second Corinthians chapter 5. Turn there in your Bible. Second Corinthians five, verses seventeen through twenty-one, it says here: Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away; behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, 
as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You have been given a position as a Christian. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to you. So you can't say, you know, well, now I have my truth, and you have your truth, and we need to respect one another's truth. That's nonsense. Okay, that's not what the King James Bible teaches. The King James Bible teaches there is absolute truth, everything else is a lie. You know, we as Christians have to stand for absolute truth. You know, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You say, well, I think some parts of the Bible might be mistranslated and some of the... You can't take a stand like that if you are a Bible-believing Christian. Hey, if this book here is not the truth, scrap it. Get another book. See, that's the problem with these new versions. They come out and they say, the Revised Standard Version, or the, I'm sorry, the Revised Version. We'll go way back. The Revised Version. This is a better translation. Was it perfect? Well, no. Well, let's bring out the American Standard Version. Is it perfect? No. Let's bring out the Revised Standard Version. Is it perfect? No. New American Standard Version? Perfect? No. New King James Version? NIV? Living Bible? Message Bible? New World Translation? They just keep on coming out with these new versions, and you say, which one is perfect? Well, none of them are. When are you going to come out with a perfect Bible? Oh, well, never. <laughs> That's why I'm not a new versionist. Because they say this book here is not perfect, and you say, what's the replacement then? They don't have one. And they'll say, well, the Hebrew and the Greek. Oh, which edition? Well, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they take away final authority. That's why it's a move that's not of the Lord. You have to get to a point in time where you say, this book that I hold in my hands is God's perfect word. And I'm going to stand for it as absolute truth. And I'll tell you right now, for over 400 years now, people have been stand, holding to this as the standard of absolute truth. And God does miraculous things with their lives. God will bear witness to this book. You don't have that with any other version. I tried it. You know, these people, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, you King James only nut. I've tried the other versions. They don't work. But you see, we're supposed to stand for absolute truth. And we are supposed to go out and commit absolute truth to other people. He said, well, I don't know about this thing of standing. I mean, I think that we should be willing to compromise on some points. Well, let's look about that. Turn to Galatians, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6. Are we supposed to be stubborn in our stands? You know, or should we just, you know, seek to tolerate other religions and other belief systems and, and show people that we respect them and that we, re we can respectfully agree to di disagree and all this stuff like that? Let's look about that. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 says here, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. There's that T word again. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Lowercase w. It's talking about a written book. You say, well, uh, I think that we can compromise. How can you compromise in war? You know, the enemy's over there. They're shooting at you. And you say, well, I don't want to shoot to kill. Maybe I'll just try to graze his helmet or something. You know, maybe I'll just show him that, you know, I'm only going to load my magazine of my rifle here. I'm only going to load it half with live rounds, half with, with dummy rounds. You know, why would you do a thing like that? We are in a battle, brethren. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be the ones that are taking the truth to the lost world. We can't compromise. We can't say, you know, well, some truth, I just, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm not going to stand for some truth. You can't do that. You have to be willing to get the truth out to the people.
you say, then I should always, I should always speak truth in every situation. I didn't say that either. We're going to check about that later. Who is worthy of the truth and who isn't? Now, the question comes up, how do we get truth? You say, well, getting saved. Well, sure. But there's a lot of things that you have to learn after you get saved. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. You know, a lot of people try to think that they get saved and then, you know, it's just easy from then on. It isn't. There's a lot of things that you're going to have to study, a lot of things that you're, you're just not going to be able to learn from a book. Okay? And I'm not saying the Bible. I'm saying, you know, there's some things that, that uh, you have to just experience. Okay? And reading all the books and getting all the education and everything, you're not going to, not going to get it. Proverbs 23, verse 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. You know, there's a, a statement. They say, you know, that guy sold out. Now, many times that does refer to money. You know, some of these big name preachers, you know, a lot of times they will actually sell out for money. A lot of times they'll back off on the Catholics so that they can get more money coming in. You know, a lot of times they'll back off on 501c3 so that their people will give more money because they know they can write it off on their taxes. A lot of times they'll sell out and keep their mouth shut about a lot of things so that they don't, you know, offend the tithers, you know. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot more to getting the truth and buying the truth than just money, all right? Now, is there going to be money involved in you learning the truth? Yeah, many times there will be. You see, there are going to be videos, and there are going to be books, and there are going to be audio recordings, and there are going to be gospel tracts and things like that. You're going to have to spend some of your money to buy that stuff. Why? To learn the Bible better. You know, every Christian out there should have a decent little library. Now, you don't need 50 books or something like that, or, you know, 600 or so. You know, you don't need that many books, but there are some books that you should have that can help you in your Christian walk. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, I recommend that. A good concordance. Don't mess with the Greek or the Hebrew, but, you know, a good concordance can be a big help in you studying the Scriptures. Um, autobiographies from, from good Christians from the past, they can help you. That You can learn some things there. You can see that they struggled with things that you're struggling with. Uh, there's a lot of Bible helps out there, a lot of things that are fine, and that's going to cost you money. All right? And when you buy some good reference materials... You don't, you know, get a Webster's 1828 dictionary and look up three words and say, okay, I'm going to sell it. No, that's something that you need to hang on to for the rest of your life. All right, you buy it and you don't sell it. But let's look at a couple other things here that have to do with this thing of buying the truth and selling it not. All right, so first of all, you have their money, actual physical money is something that you have to spend. How about the cost of losing your friends? Are you willing to pay that price to get the truth. You say, well, Brian, I think that I can keep my friends and get the truth. I've never met one Bible-believing Christian that's been able to keep every single friend that they've ever had. Not one. And I'm even talking about professing Christian friends. When you start to get militant for the truth and zealous for the truth, you'll see people, your friends, you know, you'll see them dropping like flies. How about loss of family? Are you willing to pay that price? I know a lot of you have. I have. My wife has. You know, you lose out on family. If you want the truth, you're going to have to be willing to pay that price. How about loss of career? You know, I know brethren that have been fired from their jobs for witnessing on the job site. Are you willing to pay that price? A lot of Christians go, well, brother, I, you know, I, I got to put food on the table. I mean, after all, 1 Timothy 5, you know, verse 8, I think it is, it talks about, you know, providing not for his own is worse, you know, denied the faith and is worse than infidel and all that, you know, and I, so I, I can't witness and I can't give out tracts and I can't this and I can't that because other, after all, you know, I can't lose my job. And if I want to advance at my job, I got to keep my mouth shut about the Lord really? So then God can't protect you? God can't give you a better job? See the problem? 
You say, well, I, I really want to be used of the Lord. Okay, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to buy the truth and sell it not? Buy the truth by giving up lots of things, money, friends, family, career, all that stuff, and then not selling out. Not going back and saying, oh, I, I won't talk about the Bible version issue, and I won't talk about this, and I won't talk about that. See, you're supposed to buy the truth and sell it not. Here's another one for you. How about loss of health? Are you willing to sacrifice your health to serve Jesus Christ? You know, when you start to read books for hours and hours and hours on end, it's going to start to make problems for your health. Are you willing to pay that price? How about your time? You know, in America, we want to be entertained. We are a nation of people that feel that they have to be entertained at least once a day, seven days a week. You know, through television or through the internet or through movies or through whatever. I just want to have fun. I need to be entertained. I need some entertainment time. And I'm not saying that all entertainment is wrong or a sin, but it becomes a sin when you become a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. See, are you willing to sacrifice your time? Something to think about. You say, well, if I do this stuff, I mean, what is God's truth really worth? I mean, what is the, what is the value, the monetary value, we'll say, of God's truth? You know, well, there is actually value to it. Let's look about that. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs 8, verse 6 through 11. It says here, Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Hmm. You see that T word again there? My mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. Let me finish up here. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that, they may, that, that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Hmm. That's very interesting there. I mean, we don't really even understand that, comprehend that fully, because most of us, you know, money to us is paper, uh, or even digital, which is even worse than paper. <laughs> You know, we don't really understand the thing of gold and silver and rubies being currency, you know. Um, that's because our nation's about ready to fall and we're heading into the cashless system. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if you would see physical gold and silver and, and precious stones someplace, and you would have the choice of, we'll say, $500 million worth of gold, bullion, and silver and precious stones rather than understanding this book, most people would take the gold and silver and precious stones. They wouldn't want this book. They wouldn't want the knowledge of the book. See, that's how carnal people are. But the fact is, according to God, knowledge of this book is more valuable than gold and silver and precious stones. And you say, well, then I'll never get that stuff. I have to give that stuff up. Well, in a sense, down here you do. But when you get to heaven, going to be a different story there. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 21 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, we've been over that verse many times in, in our studies, but the fact is, it's good to keep reminding yourself of that thing, your treasures are not down here on earth. If you have a choice to go in and put in extra hours at work to make that overtime pay, you know, time and a half, or you have, you can either do that, or you can go and you can do some tracting, or you can spend some time with the Lord reading and studying the Word, or you can make a video and put it on YouTube, witnessing to the lost world. In other words, if you have job time where you can earn more money, you're given the opportunity to earn more money, or you're given the opportunity to take part in the ministry of reconciliation, you do much better to serve the Lord. 
Because when you do that, you're putting a deposit into your heavenly bank account. And that heavenly bank account is never going to have a problem with a bank run or a bank holiday or a financial collapse, hyperinflation, whatever. There is no hyperinflation in heaven. There's no, there are no bank runs. There are no, oh no, the, you know, the Lord, you know, is kind of like, I, I hate to tell you this, you know, you get up there and he says, uh, well, you really stocked up a lot of treasures there in your mansion, but crazy thing. I mean, you know, it got broke into the one night. I, I, we're tr still trying to find who did it. You know, we don't really know. Of course not. But can that happen down here on the earth? Yeah. Just met a guy just, just last night. And, uh, he was telling me how his four-wheeler, uh, he had a ATV, you know, and, and the thing was in his garage, locked in his garage. He came out the next morning, it's gone, gone, disappeared. No, you know, way to pay for the thing or anything like that. I guess he didn't have any insurance or anything, which, you know, shouldn't really have that anyhow. But the point is, gone. A couple thousand dollars, poof, just gone, like that. And how many people have had that same experience? things have been stolen from you. I've had things stolen from me, you know, and it's gone. Just boom. You work hard to pay for the thing and, and just like that, boom, it's gone. But not so with heaven. Your rewards that you're laying up in heaven, nobody can take them things from you. Go to the next page here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Back to the New Testament. 